Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. In keeping with our theme of modified 50s Les Pauls that we've been talking about, I wanted to take an in-depth look at Mom and Dad's Music Shop in Clarksville, Tennessee, who have listed this 1954 gold top for only 11500 bucks. That is a steal and a half. Well, it doesn't have a double cutaway like the one I reviewed that you can check out here. It seems like the layout is about right for what a 54 should be. Looks like the wrap tail has been swapped out on this one, but maybe original P90s, at least it hasn't been routed out or anything like that. Why is this thing so cheap? There must be a catch. I mean, look at that beautiful original golden finish. It's got nicks and dings like anything you would expect. Some of the gold's wearing where the person's arm was rubbing. There's not too much of a greening effect going on on this one, but it seems to be a pretty solid buy so far. Looking at the side profile, you can see it's definitely been worn in a little bit, but the strap buttons are original style. And just from a quick glance here, you know, some people might be able to see what's wrong with it right now, but others maybe not right away. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's look at the back. X marks the spot for treasure, right? But I, I'm not really sure what that is. Is that in the wood grain? I mean, it's totally possible. I would like a guitar that had natural wood grain like that. That's super deep. Because you got a little bit right here and there, but it could also just be some marks that were put on the guitar. It's unclear at this point. And then we look at the back. I think this is when a lot of people will start to realize, huh, huh, something, something's wrong here. That's one, two, three piece neck on a 50s Les Paul. And then we get to our headstock. Oh, <laughs> that's a big headstock. That's a 70s style headstock. And we have Schaller tuners on this thing. So we flip it over to the backside and yeah, sure enough, that is what we're seeing. And that is a strange serial number. Generally, you only see a different colored ink stamp than the black one on like the dark back gold tops. So 42141, what is going on with this thing? Here's the rest of the title, Factory Reneck. Okay, so I have a soft spot for Gibson Factory Reneck guitars because they're just so goofy, I love them. I had a 1976 Gibson Les Paul Custom once that was sent back to Gibson for a re-neck in the early 2000s. You can check out this video right here. That was such a fun mystery to document and process through. That's one of the first videos that really blew up on my channel because it wasn't advertised as a re-neck when I had first bought it. <laughs> So the whole story behind this one is, yes, it is a real 50s Les Paul Gibson that just had something happen to the neck, either a neck break or something. And then in the early 70s, it was sent into Gibson to get a new headstock. Okay, yeah, that's kind of cool in my opinion. But then again, I like 70s specs. So being able to have a 50s body with a 70s neck is just hilarious enough for me to like it. Multi-piece mahogany neck with a volute, just in case you missed it. Big ol' headstock. And it even comes in the best case that was ever created, the Gibson Gen 2 chainsaw case. The version with three latch. I guess it could be a Gen 1. I can't see if there's a back latch or not. But that definitely came a little bit later. So let's see what the seller's saying here. Get our facts. Okay, 54 gold top model. We knew that. They're saying this was returned to Gibson in the late 60s and was re-necked with the three-piece mahogany neck that appears to be from 1970. So no made in USA stamp, extremely small volute. I don't know if I agree with that. This looks more so almost mid 70s to me. Because if it is late 60s, it would have to be 69. But this logo, I'm not gonna go too far in depth in this one. That just looks like that 73 to 75-ish era. And heck, it could even be later than that. I don't actually agree with what they're saying that this is a small volute. That looks just like the standard volute size that they were using. But it is possible it was a 69 because that's when they started using the three-piece necks and when they started to use the larger headstock style. At the end of the day, does it really matter? No, not unless it was actually 1968 and it had the small headstock still. They bring up the fact that it does not say Made in USA on it, though. And maybe that's how they're guiding that to where it is. My guess, though, is whoever had the re-neck job done, they asked them not to put that on there because they were probably just trying to match the original serial number and not stamping anything else. That'd be my guess anyways. So they're saying that they can only assume that it went back to the factory for a re-neck because of a broken neck or a peg head. So it doesn't even seem like we have documented 
evidence and proof that this went back to Gibson. So it's possible that somebody else just made this neck. I mean, the, the work looks good. It looks era correct for a early 70s one, in my opinion. But without any type of a receipt or correspondence from Gibson back in the day, there's not really a good way to prove it. But that was the same story on my 76. The only proof that I had was there was a little pamphlet brochure that kind of made me go, okay, did Gibson do this? And I think I was able to get them to verify that they did do the work. I, I don't remember. That was quite a while ago. But it is indeed the original P90s. And just like we found on my 54 that I had demoed, they say it excels with a dirty amp and the neck pickup sounds killer. They took the words right out of my mouth. The neck pickup in mine was fantastic. So what a lot of people were saying is the bridge pickups are not as hot and bitey and attacking as we think of them today. So it wasn't necessarily that there was anything wrong with that bridge pickup. It was just how they were done, apparently. Granted, I would like to try a lot more 50s Gibsons to see if they're all like that. But even Vance, the original owner of the 54 that we demoed, he said it was always like that from day one. That's why he loved that neck pickup and was always on it, which kind of further explains why he wanted to move that toggle switch so he'd never got bumped off of it. So a 54 gold top, how much did these things sell for? It ranges between like 28 to 40,000, depending on how clean. So let's take it from the top of the market and say it's probably worth 40% of what it used to be. So that takes us down to about 16,000. So it's at this point where it's like, okay, is this actually still an all right player's guitar? I mean, it doesn't have the original rap tail, but having the Leo Kwan on there that's intonatable, that's a nice touch. So I was at the point where it's like, yeah, I might want to document this weird oddity. But then I saw it. No, it's not nothing to do with the toggle switch, nicks and dings. Nope, nothing to do with the knobs and the thumb bleeders. Nothing to do with the original P90 still being in here. And nothing to do with the mysterious X's. <laughs> the re-neck got broken again. What kind of haphazard barbarian owned this guitar? First, they broke the 50s neck so badly the whole thing had to be replaced, and then they broke the new neck on top of it. I mean, like, there appears to even be, like, dowels and splines in this thing on top of just the regular repair. Now, it was a good repair. Like, I can get behind a story when a guitar has been re-necked, but when the re-neck has been repaired on top of it, that's when it's just... Yeah, that that's that's not something I would like to own. It's it's just too much for me. But it definitely makes sense where they've priced it. This one will probably get just as much hate as the other one. But I would venture to say they're relatively where it should be. I would imagine this could probably bring between seven to ten thousand, maybe. So it seems priced fairly for what it is. It's only been listed three months. Guitars like these take six months to a year to sell. But you have to find somebody that doesn't mind that it's been re-necked and that the new neck has also been repaired, pretty much negating the whole purpose of the re-neck in general. I'm sure for the right amount of money, somebody might purchase this and just convert it to burr specs and put like a new neck on it if somebody wanted an original Les Paul body. But I don't know if they'd really want to do that because, I mean, you're paying a lot of money just for an original Les Paul body. But yeah, I thought that was kind of cool and I wanted to share it with you guys today. But there's one more thing I wanted to talk to you guys about today. It's been a while since Reverb has came out with a new feature. So a week ago when I got a new notification, I was kind of surprised. Their newest series is called My Collection. So this isn't sponsored. I just wanted to check it out with you guys. So basically, they will show you what you've purchased on the site and then you can choose to add it to your collection where it looks like you're basically building a reverb listing here. So you write down what it is, what year, what's unique. Like this one will say it's the custom shop original decal. And you can put what you paid for, 1800. But you have to upload your own photos. You can't use what was already used in the other reverb listing. And that's because reverb doesn't actually allow you to reuse photos, despite people doing it all the time. That's mainly just to protect people, so nobody's scamming using old photos. I guess we can add tags, you can add a description, your own notes to yourself, okay. This just looks like you're building a listing, and then we say we save the item. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't add any photos, so it automatically added the ones from the seller. <laughs> it doesn't look like all of them, just a few of them. 
But then in theory, I guess this is going to track the values and let you know, like, there's some guys that have owned guitars, like, take the Silver Burst last year. They might not have known that they were out of nowhere selling for 10 grand. So something like that I could see would be helpful. But at the end of the day, I really think this is mainly for reverb, because then if you need to sell something, it's easy just to click a button like this, and it auto-fills most of it for you. Not everything, but I, I just thought I'd share with you guys if you were interested. The only downside I could see to this is if Reverb leaks some information, then people could potentially, you know, know what you have at your address that's associated with your account. And if you're a more private user, you might not want that information out there. I mean, it's different when you're a dealer in a store, you have a whole bunch of stuff. But some of those security reasons is why I don't actually list where I'm actually located anymore. I just called myself Trogleyville, Ohio. <laughs> But what is great about this is it's really easy to document your serial number. So if you don't already have a spreadsheet that you have photos of the guitar and the serial number, you really should because that helps you, heaven forbid, if anything happens to your collection, either flood damage, storm damage, random robbery, break-in, you're a lot more likely to recover your guitar if you have the serial number and photos documenting that you used to own it. Or say it's nothing nefarious, you just sold a guitar 10 years ago and you'd like to find it again. Having that serial number is going to help you. So feel free to chat about that in the comments section today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.